Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, just give me one second to get my notes set up. Okay, I'm going to drop my webcam for this call because I have one monitor. I am blessed to have one. Does everything look good? Oh, sorry, we lost you there. Do you want me to switch oh. to your display? Yeah, yeah, can you switch? Yep, please. Perfect, got it. Okay, ready? All right, hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Dragalis, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, a topic that I've been really excited about for a long time, that, and I've been uh, focusing on for some number of years. Um, so I was really excited when Ryan asked me to do the keynote about this topic in particular, because I know it's been kind of really hot in our community. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, designing with data uh, and what that means. And if, if you don't know, we're going to be talking about it in, in a great amount of detail, um, so you should feel comfortable with it by the end. Uh, so when I initially demoed this talk for some of my friends, the feedback was, you have to tone it down. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit much uh, in the sense that um, it's very heavily geared towards practicality. Um, and so instead of changing any of the content, I think it's more appropriate to put a warning on the front and say that uh, I'm an engineer, I'm not, I'm not an academic, I'm not a purist, um, and I'm probably going to offend a lot of the type systems people. So sorry, uh, a lot of it's done in the name of practicality and having forward progression. Um, so I, I split my time these days between uh, working at Viasat and developing Onyx, which I think a lot of you are familiar with. Um, both of these things are really important because they inform the way that I do design. Uh, so Viasat is a company based out of San Diego, California that builds geosynchronous satellites. Um, they work on the design for these things and then they are built by uh, a manufacturer such as Boeing. And they launch these large satellites up about 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface. And Viasat focuses on the initial satellite design as well as the cloud infrastructure uh, on the ground to support these things. And that's the, the area that I focus on with my team. Um, so that from one end of the perspective, a lot of my job is about um, doing very heavy, high reliability, uh, customer-facing operations. And on the other end of the spectrum, I spend the other half of my time developing and uh, maintaining Onyx. Uh, Onyx is a distributed, fault-tolerant, high-performance, and scalable data processing platform that essentially aims to ingest gigantic amounts of data um, through a cluster of machines and uh, to perform computations over, over the incoming data and update um, stateful views uh, as, as an aggregate. Um, so both of these things are, are really what influences my philosophy on design and the way that I, I end up building systems. And they've led me to, to this land of data-driven design, which is something that we talk about a lot, but um, we're not really specific about in, in an interesting way. Um, so we have this phrase that we, we use closure data in our libraries. This is, this is a phrase that's really pervasive throughout the community. We're using closure data, but it's helpful to step back and talk about what exactly that means. Because for someone outside our community, they're gonna raise an eyebrow um, because all languages have data structures. Typically, they're given to you as, as, typed, uh, as a type or typed collections, like um, you know, a hash map or a set, for example. Uh, and almost everyone's working with an app that has durability in some sense. Uh, and so when you use the nebulous phrase that you're using data, uh, it's fair for someone to call you out on it because you may not be doing anything in particular that's different. Um, so we're going to kind of put that under the microscope. Um, to contrast that, though, it, it's informative to take the opposite phrase, which would be to use code. Um, so for example, these are three regular closure expressions, um, just doing regular arithmetic operations. And so this is what we would tend to mean when we say that our, our program uses code. Um, to, to flip it around again, because we need to start with a base for what people normally think of how to program, you can, you can say that this is what people try to get at when they say, I use closure data to describe my API. So instead of three calls, three, three actual evaluations, I now have three expressions, which are just data structures. So these are three maps with keys uh, of F and args that have um, some sort of like function denoted as a keyword now, along with their respective arguments. Um, and instead of having three concrete invocations that you make against those expressions, 
we have one calculate function that's going to take each of those maps as arguments and destructure them and then look up the appropriate function um, inside and perform the invocation on its behalf. And so it, it looks as if we've gone way out of the way to have seemingly a little bit more flexibility. And, and it's fair to ask why um, and what the benefit is. Um, so again, we need to step back and, and, and evaluate why we do these things. And it's helpful to do that through an object-oriented lens. That's where most of us came from, and that's kind of a good perspective to talk about um, how things ended up the way they are. So this is not meant to be an OO bashing slide. This is supposed to be an objective analysis about things that are different uh, in closure from um, object-oriented languages. And I think the first thing that, that ends up uh, substantially impacting the way that we work is type multiplicity. Um, in an object-oriented language, we have a, a high degree of types. You're encouraged to make a new type every time you have a new entity. In functional programming, specifically in Clojure, um, we, we eschew making new types. We use hash map again and again. We use uh, vectors and sets. We don't make new types all the time. And so there's, there's uniformity in the number of types that we're using. We keep the multiplicity quite low. As far as it, in relationship to the database, which is not exactly calling out the database in particular, but it's a good example of, of a third party that we need to talk to. Um, there's a map to relationship between uh, an object and its object store. There's usually some kind of a mapping layer, like an ORM going on. And, and so the point here is that uh, it's not a direct relationship. Things in Clojure, we use maps, we use lists, we use sets. These things can go right into the database. They don't need another translation layer for you know, what exactly it means to go from uh, an application piece of code uh, into a durable data store. Building on that, you have a relationship to the language. Um, it, it bears asking, can you, know, can you take a, a, a construct in your language like Clojure um, with a set, and can you move it across languages? Um, for, for us, that's a direct relationship right there. We can move one to the other and not lose semantics. Um, but if you have an object, you're making this new entity every time, there, there's something else going on there. You're probably leveraging extra language constructs, which really leads me to the last point, which is the, the generalization of all these things is context. What else do I need to know about the thing that I just made? If I make a new, uh, new class to represent my, you know, a customer, for example, there are a lot of things being conveyed out of band. Um, for example, you might be leveraging things like transients or volatile fields. And those things don't translate very well across languages. But in Clojure, for instance, if you're using the data structures that are supplied, those things translate readily across all different contexts, and everything is conveyed in band. And so these are important things to think about. I'm not saying that any of them are good or bad. They're just, I, I think they're relatively objective to say. And so there's repercussions to doing this stuff. Um, and, and that being said, today's talk is, is different from the way that I usually give presentations in. Um, and, and I want to try to convey what I'm saying in the form of like anecdotal evidence. Um, I, I kind of grew up cutting my teeth with closure and learning how to build big distributed systems and managing all the activity that comes around them. Um, and I think data-driven design has pretty much been paramount to getting where I am. I think it's been the thing that has really made what I've done successful. Um, and so I want to be able to share exactly what happened to me and, and, and how. So we're going to be looking at six different scenarios today. Um, these are real world things that happened to me. And I want to talk about the pros and cons um, and, and, and sort of a general theme for, for each specific scenario. Um, and we'll talk about the repercussions along the way. And because this is a longer talk, uh, I have a progress bar at the bottom. Each of these little scenarios is meant to be like a, a self-contained thing that you can take and apply to your own work. So if you lose, you lose your attention, as I do all the time, um, just look at the bottom, and that's how you know what kind of story that I'm on, especially if you miss the break between one and the next. So I want to start out with a brief thought experiment and pose a question um, asking why there aren't more property-based testing frameworks in object-oriented languages. Um, it's obvious that it's an incredibly powerful testing technique. I think a couple months ago now, Gary Fredericks was using test check and found a bug in Postgres serializability. Um, that's absolutely crazy because that's the, the strictest form of uh, consistency that Postgres offers, and it should be the safest thing that you can use. Um, so we know that this is, this is an amazing thing. What's holding it back from becoming more mainstream? 
did we miss a cultural exchange? Um, is it just not as good as we think it is? I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think there's a technical barrier. Um, and so I wanna move towards an example um, and show something that's on the test check readme that it, uh, demonstrates using a, a test check generative case for um, idempotent sort. So this is gonna generate a vector of integers, uh, random vectors of integers, and then check that sorting the vector is equal to the sorted sorted vector. So that that's an idempotent check. Um, and so data generation is like half of the secret sauce of test check. That's why it's so good because it doesn't miss generalizations or doesn't miss specific cases, excuse me, that humans tend to miss. Um, and so the idea is that the construction of the rose trees, which are the underpinning technique for coming up with these seemingly random inputs are, are designed not to miss edge cases because they can make predictions about what you're gonna do. And what I mean by that is, uh, is the need to drill into the types that you're gonna see. Um, automatic data generation relies on it being feasible because you know everything that could have been generated in the first place. So if we look at the values in Clojure, you have simples and you have composites. The simples are things like int, long, double, string, and, and so forth. Um, there's, there's a few more, it's not very many. And composites like list, vector, set, map, and, and just a couple more, there's, there's not very many. And so the point is we could write generators for all of these things, and we have done that. And so there's little need to go and do that again. That's an infrequent operation that's relatively expensive and, and kind of tricky to get right. But in a type heavy world where you have the, the regular simples like int long and double, you're gonna have a few other things. But if you introduce a new type every time, like a new customer object, you have to write a new generator. And if you have to have a, a new class for a database result, you need a new generator there as well. Um, and so this ends up being hugely problematic in terms of the expense of being able to, to being able to participate in the test check framework. Um, and, and so the idea that's going on here is that I'll, I'll argue that in this case, and not in all cases, just in some, is that a proliferation of types is going to lead to a linear increase in effort to participate in these kinds of things. Whereas if you have a constant number of types and you're con and you're reusing these things, you're going to have a constant level of effort. And so I like to, to have the takeaway for this being that you have a basis for uniformity. Um, if you know all the data structures that you're gonna encounter, you can prepare to see all these things because they're a limited, knowable set of types. And in fact, generative testing is just one case that I came up with to, to make this point. I could have picked any of these other things. These are all um, little features of using data as a point of generation um, to, to get work done. And they all rely on there being a, a solid basis for uniformity knowing all the types that you're gonna encounter. That's really important. So the next um, mini experience that I wanna share with you is, is about API multiplicity. You've probably never heard this term before because I completely made it up, um, but I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't find this anywhere else. So sometimes you just need to make up new phrases. The whole idea of how to design solid systems actually clicked into place a few years ago when I was listening to Stu Holloway give a talk about Datomic. And he had a similar graphic up here. Um, and the exercise was to tease apart what we mean when we say information model, API, and DSL. Because we just sling these terms around all the time and just, it's very messy. Um, they're different things and being able to draw borders around one and the next uh, helps a lot. Because having fences actually makes really great neighbors in systems design, as it turns out. Uh, but I'm gonna posit that a well-designed system has what's known as an information model at its base. So what exactly is an information model? It's kind of a, a more formal definition here. An information model is a specification of the structure and semantic arrangement of a sequence of data structures. Now take note that this is markedly different from just any old ad hoc data structure because we're formally assigning meaning to the elements that are present. Information models are language neutral. They're, they're made up of simples like strings and integers and keywords and composites like maps and lists and so forth. And just as an example, Onyx is centrally designed around having an information model. That's kind of its key thing. And the content on this slide is an example of uh, flow conditions expressed entirely through data structures. Um, this expresses where data is gonna be routed around your cluster. And the keys in the map are predetermined and have rigorously defined meaning. And this 
is where we start building up from. This is the base. Because on top of our information model, we might build an API. And I remember Stu ex expressly um, saying the word might, because this is not always a requirement. And this actually makes people really uncomfortable because when we talk about what I know to be an API, this is like the, the guts of a closure library. And, and people tend to shy away from you know, the thought that this might not actually be necessary all the time. Um, and so again, an API is just the functions that we, we tend to think of in Clojure that compose with one another. They have doc strings. Um, and ideally, they're going to be harnessing the information model that they're built on top of. Uh, it's not the case here because this is more of a utility library that I'm showing. But uh, you get the idea that you're going to drop down one layer lower um, using your information model from the API. Uh, and finally, the last building block on the pyramid are domain-specific languages. And DSLs are a most murky concept because people really use this phrase wherever they want to just mean a, a concise language that does what they want it to do. Um, but again, it has a more rigorous meaning. A DSL is a foreign fit to purpose language that's gonna require its own parser to interpret. And SQL is a golden example of a DSL. And ideally, a DSL is gonna harness the API layer, which will in turn harness the information model layer. You could actually skip straight down from the DSL layer into the information model layer if you wanted to. Um, but if you're going you're gonna to do that, you're probably going to want to have the convenience of, of an API to handle the semantics working through a parse tree. So people tend not to do that. Um, and again, you, you might make a DSL on top of your API. And I think people understand that this isn't always, um, always a requirement because it's a little bit more out there in terms of the, the abstraction layer. But, um, but it, it's the same deal. That's not a requirement. It's useful in some circumstances. So this is a little bit more of a salient point. But as it turns out, you can gain a lot of insight um, by inverting and removing layers and just playing around with this pyramid and having quick thought experiments about what's happening. So let's say that we totally forgo the information model, as most applications tend to do. Uh, our, our system is maybe just a DSL built on top of an API, and, and that's it. And again, SQL is like the number one offender of this thing. It's, this is exactly a perfect case. Um, so who here has built a system that takes opaque strings as input and then runs them through a pipeline to decipher some semantic uh, meaning from that, which is, again, the use case of SQL. Um, but what inevitably happens is that you end up writing a parser for this DSL, which in turn is going to inv invoke API functions to produce some result object. And it's very opaque as to what's happening inside the pipeline. It's, it's just as bad as the input because the killer is that your visibility in the progression of parsing ends up dropping to zero um, because you had no information to emit along the way. Most libraries don't have that kind of emission. Um, and it's, it's a really frustrating thing to work through. One of the alternatives that you can have though is an information model layer flipped and put on top of an API. And this should sound really familiar because this is what most ClojureScript JVM apps are because they'll use information as the medium for transporting things across the wire. And I'd argue that this is actually just fine. Um, we know from experience that this, this ends up being successful, but it gets dangerous when your information model layer is, is ad hoc. Um, I'm sure most people here have written some closure script and you end up catching a bug because of an element in your UI changed, which maybe semantically malformed your Eden that you're passing over the wire. And so the lack of rigor is what can end up burning you here. Um, Fair question though, which is worse when you mess up the layers or when you just outright start removing them? Um, I'm not sure because in some circumstances you can end up being totally okay. And I really haven't reached a conclusion, but I'm kind of interested in what everyone else thinks. Um, but most often I'll tend to just avoid it and try to do it right the first time when I can, which is not always possible when working with legacy systems, but um, we can try. So the purpose of the explanation though, isn't to rant about what happens when we do it wrong. Um, I want to talk about something wonderful that happens when we do it right. With proper layering in place, you can use a technique that I mentioned earlier, which is called API multiplicity. And it's just that, right? We break the pyramid into pieces at every level and support APIs and DSLs in the same system. Right? I'm going to have more than one of these things. We were used to seeing these really big block diagram architectures where people fight about what's in the API and what's in the DSL. And it's like ridiculous because you end up with these monoliths. Um, 
And, and they become monoliths because there's no information, right? Everything bottomed out at the API layer because you lost any ability to compose any further. And so you have to jockey for surface area in the API that you're building. Um, but when you build a system whose APIs are built on top of an information model layer of immutable, semantically well-defined values, you can, you can do this. You can have two or three APIs or like 100 APIs. It doesn't matter because they're not competing for the same space anymore. And the idea is extends to DSLs as well. You can support discrete DSLs on top of discrete APIs. Um, and so it's just the same compositional power being extended up a layer further. Um, and so you can start to consider this as more of an option when you're using data structures uh, as, as your protocol for communication in the API. So if I was gonna give you a more sort of concrete example, um, suppose your company is building uh, a new initiative around a library that already exists and you need to use it from two different APIs. This happens a lot. You have one use case that needs to use it from a high level API and another use case where you're gonna come at it from a lower level API. Maybe the higher level thing is sitting in a web tier in ClojureScript and so it, you, know, you want kind of high level access and maybe the lower level application is gonna try to use it from an API that's uh, more performance sensitive, like from a streaming perspective. And so both of these things make sense. It's, it's totally fine to want both of these things at the same time. But unfortunately what usually happens is one of two things. If you're gonna to try to have two competing APIs in the same space, usually people will take the original library in question and then factor it apart in some way into two or more distinct libraries. And what you get is one library turning into four. You have this code explosion that's really bad. And it's reminiscent of what happens when you write object-oriented code that lacks these reusable data structures. It's really a parallel story. The other thing that can happen is that everyone gets pulled into a meeting and bickers over what goes into the API. Um, and it turns political, and that's not where we want to be. Because the moral of the story is that everyone in this little story could have actually been trying to do the right thing and in their own way have been succeeding. And it can still lead to a conflict in design. And it's, this isn't always gonna be possible to avoid, but if you use information at your lowest layer, oftentimes you can escape this. Um, and, and the consequences are really terrific, not just from a, a team collaboration perspective, but from a product growth area too. Uh, and, and so the takeaway here is that you wanna support information, model, information models to have views over your system rather than to create and design layers underneath of it. We're very used to doing um, a sort of layered approach where we're building inside of its own system, inside of itself. But information lets you extend outside of your system because it can cross language boundaries and network boundaries and time and all those really good things. So the next uh, experience that I wanna kind of share is, is contrasting two closure libraries that I've used over the years, years to do uh, SQL query processing. Um, and we're gonna talk about HoneySQL and Korma, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but if not, we'll do a little bit of a primer. Um, so these things aid in composing SQL queries and they expose a set of functions that allow developers to express queries as SQL, which are transformed into those actual SQL strings that you ship to servers. And so in a sense, both libraries are pretty hands-off and they're amenable to um, a purely functional usage, which you know, is really good for this kind of a talk. So Korma is touted as a library that offers a developer-focused API. If we wanna query a table, say like a user's table, um, we declare that it exists with def entity and that's presumably a macro. Um, and then we use functions on top of the results of that macro, such as uh, where, order, and limit to denote the syntactic blocks of the SQL language. Uh, and these sort of compose with each other inside of its own argument set. And so we'd invoke this function and get back a SQL string and presumably turn around and send that off to a server somewhere. HoneySQL on the other hand has a data-driven API. It's really, really thin. Instead of having a function per syntactic element, um, it has a single, well, uh, just a few, but the one I wanna focus on is a single function called format that takes a closure map um, as an argument and returns the SQL string just as before. Um, and so again, again, in the same case, we're using keywords this time to denote the syntactic blocks rather than other corresponding functions. 
So what's, what's the big deal here? Why should you prefer one over the other and when? The primary thing that grabs my attention when I put these two things side by side is the issue of composability. Can you compose the arguments for HoneySQL? Yeah, sure, they're, they're closure maps. You can use the standard core sequence functions to manipulate them. But how about Korma? Can you compose that? It's unlikely, or at least not without inventing a new set of utilities around yourself to do that. So you've left yourself with little opportunity for reuse and the overall engineering effort rises to have this participate in another framework. But there's another interesting thing that happens here. Can you compose the result of either two of these function invocations? No, you, you can't because you're getting back a raw SQL string in both cases, which is a DSL. So the thing to take note of is that even if your arguments to a system compose, you want to figure out a way to have the outputs of your system compose as well. And this is not the fault of either of these two things. This is actually the fault of SQL. Um, but if you can do this in your own system and have arguments and results that both compose, you elevate yourself in this like you know design sense where you can be composed in another context that you re were really never aware of. Um, and so this is something we need to be ultra cognizant of when we're designing systems, because if we can get to this stage, um, boy, systems come together so much easier when you have this. Uh, and it's a really powerful design technique. So the real takeaway that I want you to have from this little story um, is a phrase that I hear all the time from a developer who's just written a new macro. They say, then I could write def whatever and it'll do this thing for me. Then I could write def whatever. I could write this. It's all about me. This, this focus turned into about me being the developer sitting at a REPL doing this really cool thing. And we've lost the focus, right? Complex, complex systems are machine to machine interactions. There's no emphasis on me, right? There's no developer sitting at their terminal invoking macros at their REPL, getting results, and then you know, pushing the system along. No, really big systems run autonomously with no human intervention. And they cross language and network borders really without any hesitation at all. The language of the system is data. It was a great talk by Rich and he absolutely nailed this point. Data composes across all boundaries and it's a common protocol. So good designers take themselves out of the equation and really good designers come back and build pieces for human interaction on top of the layers for machine interaction. Build human interfaces on top of machine interfaces. There's evidence that this, this inversion is superior across pretty much all engineering disciplines. You see this in the electric engineering field um, and you can find it elsewhere. And you heard the exact same message from Rich uh, in the language of the system talk uh, a couple of years ago now. So I wanna restate this a little bit differently because this is probably the most important point that I'm gonna make today. If you have a set of functions with a large API surface area, that is many different functions, you can often derive a tremendous amount of benefit by narrowing that surface area in the physical function space. So rather than having four discrete functions, I'm gonna have one function or just a few, and I'm gonna pass data as, as my arguments. Um, so I, I lower the number of endpoints, uh, and I, I really wouldn't hesitate to try your own system dropping the number of functions like down to one in your public API and see what that looks like. Um, just play around and see how it feels. I, I think you're probably going to like it. Um, but the point is you want to make the arguments virtualize their actual um, behavioral semantics. So this F key in these, these functions denotes logical or virtual functions. An endpoint is more of like a physical function, so to speak. And this is the idea behind CQRS, or rather command query responsibility segregation architectural pattern. Um, in terms of actual benefits, it's fair to ask why you'd want to do this because you just pushed a lot of things out of your programming language. And people shriek when you do that because all these good things in the compiler, you could get them back, but it's, it's, a, it's a kind of an art form to have both of these things at the same time. So it's maybe not something that's easily learned, but should be learned anyway. But the immediate result is that extensibility is not positional anymore. I, I can add more functions and more arguments by adjusting the payload that I send over the wire rather than adding more functions to the concrete API. Uh, and that ends up being really important. Uh, I end up usually doing this with a multi-method, but you can use a protocol or a static dispatch table. 
depends on what you need, but this, this method ends up working pretty well. You can contrast this with traditional RPC. Every time you add a new endpoint, you end up wiring a brand new call to a program on the other end of the line. With this design style, you're just altering the payload. It's, it's a one hop thing. And so this is, again, the, the, the context where a constant amount of effort is, is being had because you have a uniform number of types. You're not getting that linear scale here. Uh, there's a host of other benefits when you do this, though. And Bobby Calderwood did a, a talk at the Conj about CQRS that I highly recommend and just absolutely nailed point for point about why you'd want to do this kind of thing. One of my favorite was that um, it's really subtle. I didn't even realize you could do this. You're going to be able to discretize your load balancing better. If you're using like REST, for example, and you add more machines to your public facing API, you've scaled your entire API um, homogeneously, which is not really a desirable thing. Right? You might not always want all of your APIs to scale in the same way. But if you use this with more virtualized functions and a data-driven uh, approach to describing which, um, which public-facing functions your API offers, you have more control over that. And that ends up being really important in a scenario where you're facing very heavy load or a very heterogeneous load. Um, and finally, I'm just going to keep harping on this point pretty much for the rest of the talk. You can document the schema of these payloads across endpoints and then move that schema upstream to the caller. Especially if you're in ClojureScript, you can create actual prismatic schemas of the things that you're sending over the wire and then push them to the caller in the web tier, for example. Or if you're not using um, ClojureScript as your, your, call, your point of calling, you can just generate them into JSON and then use one of the JavaScript libraries to do this. Um, but the point is you get to catch this stuff upstream and that's really fantastic for the caller because you can reduce load on your system. Uh, if you want to condense this all into one phrase, I would say prefer fewer points of functional contact in your API. Smaller surface areas tend to be better for a lot of the things that people in this in the closure community are building, which is, I, I think is fair to say kind of heavier backend systems right now, or at least maybe that's more applicable to me than the people that I hang around. Um, so we're going to build on everything that we just discussed in a really specific way um, with something that I call a log-driven architecture. I didn't invent this, I, I kind of wandered into it, but other people have been working on it before me. And the idea is that we harness the power of minimal APIs by using a set of conventions to yield a new set of generalized behaviors. If we consider programs that are polar opposite to the territory that we usually work in, maybe things like mutable, side affecting, impure code, it feels like everything I just talked about is garbage and can't handle this um, because this is the real world. You know, th these are the things that actually make our programs difficult to build. Um, and so we need something that can cope here. The real world requires talking to databases, updating interfaces and working with legacy systems that are doing, I have no idea what. So three little lines of code, you could have three void returns, three side affecting operations. What's your information model gonna do for me now? It's a good question. Um, I want to back away for a minute and approach this um, from, from sort of a unique perspective. And all I did was take those three functions and then linearize them as, as a little graphic here. I didn't really do anything yet. Um, but I want you to picture each block being its own function invocation um, in just a more abstract manner. And so what we're going to do is, is reconceptualize the way that we, we picture those three calls as, as a sequence of blocks where those blocks can more immediately become closure maps, right? The vector represents the ordering and the map represents each block. And now I'm, I'm sort of poking at each function and giving it a pseudo name, a little alias in the FN key. Um, those keywords roughly match up to what was on the slide before, those three function invocations. Um, and so this is a description of what we did. Right in, in the, the grander scheme, this is actually pretty useless right now because it doesn't do anything. It's a description that evaluates to something that would have happened had we actually invoked those three things. Not doing anything fancy here, just hang with me a little while longer, I promise there's a point. Um, we want to set up a side mapping where we map these FN aliases to concrete functions. These are the things that I'm actually going to invoke were I to actually, you know, go out and, and perform uh, the evaluation of those expressions. So I have a mapping uh, then of an abstract description to a concrete function. Um, so we've, we've virtualized it, sort of. Uh, 
Um, and, and there's a point to, to pushing out the behavioral property and then trying to pull as many things we can into more pure direction. Um, it's a point of leverage. If you hang with me just a little while longer, I know I'm sort of dragging out these like opaque three lines of code, but I want to talk about how you could, you know, look at this differently. Um, and the idea with this approach is that we split the world into two views. We have a pure world and then we have the real world. The pure world, which I call a replica, because when you build up the pure world, it should be the same every single time, uh, is a journal of our knowledge of the world based on our actions. So we use the replica as, as a point of um, understanding as to what's happened. And the real world is just the things that are out there. It's the network, it's other processes, it's other languages running things. Um, and so we're going to use these two views of the world to, to build an architecture that's going to focus on well-defined succession transitions of the replica from one state to the next and use this to inform what we're going to do in, in the real world. Um, and, and you'll see the repercussions and what you get out of this for free. Uh, so if we return to our function sequence, we're going to play a little game, which is to zip down every entry in our log. And we're going to... We're going to invoke a set of primitives that we've sort of pre-agreed upon by using this architecture. They're shared across everyone who's going to use this sort of design. There's three really important primitives for when you're doing a log-based architecture, and you define these for yourself every time. Uh, the first one is update replica, which is going to take a replica, which is a, a immutable value, a data structure, at one point in the world, and transition it from one state to the next as a pure function. The second primitive that we need is, is do side effects, which is actually just doing things that we said we were going to do in the first place. It's a point of isolation for impurity and, and where we can push things into. And this will sound really similar to like the IO monad, for, for example, but I'm not going to go into that. But if you, if you know what that is, that's kind of where I'm going with this. Um, and finally, the reactions function is really important to build a reactive system, where as you see these log entries, you might find something of interest and then want to append new log entries afterwards. Uh, but we'll go through each of these. And again, we're just sort of virtualizing things as we go along. Um, and just as an example of what it might look like from an implementation perspective, uh, these three keywords that I have here as dispatch values for update replica match the keys in the vector that I had earlier. Um, so we're defining virtual behaviors for what it means to transition our little journal of the world from one state to the next. Um, these are going to be pure functions, and they need to be deterministic, pure, and idempotent. They need those three properties because that's what's going to buy us for free things like undo and time travel. Um, and so the ability to have your journal move forwards and backwards is, is really important. Uh, and so the game is we start at the first log entry and then we resolve its underlying concrete function. So maybe I'm going to set a value um, in a database somewhere. Um, I'm going to invoke functions in this order. I'm going to take my replica at the starting state, which I like to use um, empty map, but you can you can use whatever you want. This isn't like a um, this isn't a framework to follow. It's an idea. Uh, you're going to invoke update replica and take it from one state to the next. So I've transitioned from one immutable value to the next, and I have a new view of the world. The next thing I'm going to do is perform the side effects that I was kind of working on. And these are the actual calls that I made before. We've moved as many of the things that we could into a pure path and then isolated the impurity. Um, and so I don't really have a recipe for how you move things into the pure path more. I think this is more of a learned design skill. Um, but it, it's a good recipe for moving forward and, and having better designs that are more testable and more amenable to, to you know, um, things like time travel almost for free. Um, and so at this stage, you've carried out your side effects and you have a journal of what you've done. Uh, and finally, you might have some reactions to what just happened. You're informed on what happened in the world, and so you might append new log entries to the end. But that's really a minor point, all things considered, for uh, what I'm trying to get across. And thus we, we transition to the next log entry and we have an updated replica and you would just continue forward doing this thing. And the payoff is that you can actually move around the log and know what your, your replica value is as you move forwards and backwards. So if you hit a bug, you have a log of everything that happened and you can isolate the transition that went bad. 
and maybe hot patch the code and then look at the transition again and make sure it went okay. And then you can proceed forward. Um, this is really powerful for doing the, that kind of side affecting stuff that I talked about. You may not be able to undo the things in the real world, but you have a record of what should have happened and then you can compare it to what actually happened. Combining this with test check is an incredibly powerful thing. Um, and this is actually how Onyx is designed from a coordination standpoint. It uses this in a distributed context. Um, so when people report bugs to us that they had um, maybe a scheduler failure or something like that, we actually load up their log and then we look at what happened in the cluster by playing things forwards and backwards. And we can use a, a pure function to patch it and then play it forward and make sure that it worked. It's really magical. Uh, and I think that this design technique ought to be given a little bit more attention in a, in a general sense. And it's so valuable that we built a tool around it. Um, this is a screenshot of uh, our console replica viewer. Um, and essentially, it lets us load up and live stream a login from Zookeeper, which is that series of entries. Uh, and we can use the arrow keys to move forwards and backwards. And there's a couple of entries. This happens to be log entry 56 for something I was doing. And I can see the log entry at the top and, and everything that was going on. I can automatically see a diff of the replica between before I applied the log entry and after. And I can see the full replica um, at the end. And so this, this is hugely powerful because we've built in all kinds of things like automatic search um, and, and log entry pruning. Um, and this is a general tool. Like I'd like to factor this out and to just have this be like a general log viewer. There's not much specific to Onyx here. Um, so building, building tooling around this, this area, I think, would be a really big advancement for the closure community. Uh, and so, you know, the 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 takeaway here is that you want to split apart functionality that's pure from what's impure, and it's not always obvious how you can do it. But you can kind of learn from these techniques how there there are ways you can you can track what's going on, um, and and to to move things out of what would otherwise be a, a hopeless scenario. Um, especially when your actions linearize. Uh, I think this would be a little bit more difficult in a concurrent context where things really are happening concurrently, like truly. But when your actions linearize, linearize for example, in maybe like a closure script application, um, this would work really great. Okay, so it's not all benefits, as we know. Uh, I've, I've made 10,000 mistakes along the way doing this kind of stuff. Um, some of it performance, some of it correctness, just you name it, I've probably messed up. But something really interesting came up on the closure mailing list, uh, I, I think last week, uh, and actually cited Onyx and, and asked, is, is this the revenge of XML? I mean, we're moving everything to data, and we did this in the early 2000s. Are we going to get burned again? Like, have we not learned our lesson? And it, it's, a, it's a good question. I think it deserves to be looked at. Um, are we building these mini languages? Um, and and <laughs> I found this example in Spring. Showing, someone showed this to me. Uh, this is this is a, an XML entry that declares its value to be a tree map. Uh, implementation details have bled as far as they possibly could have. And so this is the negative end of what could happen if you let your your data driven abstractions grow in just the wrong direction. Um, there's a good idea in here somewhere. I, I sense that there's a map afoot. And in fact, it does say there, there's a map right there, but there's this other stuff that happened. Um, so, you know, we've landed in a place where we have these XML specific editors, we have IDEs built around this, and we have worse languages than when we started out with. And that was just really bad. Um, it, it was a good idea that got executed poorly. But the problem that happened was that XML does not correspond to any of the primitives that we have in our own languages. That thing that I showed you before, that's not a map. It's not like a list or a set or any of the things that we have abstractions to deal with. And this is why Eden and JSON ended up being so powerful because it says, I'm a map, I'm a vector. I am these things and your programming languages know how to handle this. And so we need to be aware that implementation details are not gonna bleed into our data because this is where it all starts to go wrong. There's a good idea in here somewhere, but we just sort of lost, lost track. Um, and that's why I'm not really afraid of going back down the XML route again. I, I don't think we're headed there. And uh, this is a decidedly different thing. But there's another thing to think about. And, and that's that this whole notion of code versus data is fuzzy and complicated. 
and we don't understand it completely. I was showing my slides to, to Chris Hauser, who's, who's a teammate of mine at Viasat, and he was looking at one of the first slides that I had, and this said, this is using code. These are three closure expressions that we invoke these things with. And he said, maybe it's code to you, but to me, that's data. This is a list, remember? Those are, those are three lists with, with three elements in the first two, two lists and then four elements in the last one. And it, that, that was a really striking thing um, because uh, we, we use the phrase, I want to data all the things. I don't agree with this at all because it's, that turns it into a black or white thing. It's not code versus data. It's all bytes, right? If you don't, if you don't have the tools to analyze the data, is it data, right? Data is from, data's from someone's perspective. Um, and so I think the thing to take away is that data is on a spectrum here. It's not black and white, and it depends on your visibility and your context for knowing what these things actually are. Um, and, and so it's, it's paramount to consider this because I, I, get, I worry that we, we try to move in a direction where we just throw everything into data structures, and then we actually do end up in the XML, um, XML space. And that's, that's a pretty terrifying thing. So it's a more delicate design, um, design skill than I think it's, it's giving credit for. Um, all of these things in mind, I, I want to present what I think is the most valuable thing that I've come up with uh, in terms of a design perspective in the last few years. And this is the idea of having a first class information model, which I think gets you around many of the, the pitfalls that, that we discussed. Um, and so the idea here is that you have a data structure that describes your information model itself in a rigorous amount of detail or reaching into metadata territory here. But the purpose is to have a single source of truth um, that describes exactly what your model looks like and enforces every detail that you can think of and is totally explicit. Usually we do this in a markdown or like a wiki style documentation, but using a data structure is far superior as I'm about to demonstrate to you. Uh, the example that I have on the slide is a, a tiny, tiny piece of Onyx's information model. Um, and it happens to be for the catalog abstraction, which is a vector of maps. And here in the model key, I'm listing every key that we allow. And we have a doc string for what it is. We, we show what type of the value can be, any restrictions on it that are you know, semantically important, what, what version we added. And again, this isn't a standard. Like, this is your blank canvas that you can paint on and do whatever you want. And I think you ought to put as, much, uh, as many assumptions that you have in here uh, as you can. And so what do you do with this now that you have one? Right? The first thing that's really important that I think you can do is to generate schemas. You can write a very small amount of code to go from that information model to this prismatic schema. Um, and doing so is hugely beneficial because you're getting uh, a high degree of, of benefit by having type checking almost for free because you generated it. Um, and, and the amount of code you needed to do it was probably pretty small. And, and so there's, there's a really big win there, being able to automatically have these things. And again, this is a general thing. This isn't specific to Onyx. We could write tooling that goes from an information model description to a schema, and that should work for pretty much everyone, assuming that our information models look roughly the same. Um, another thing that you build right on top of that is smarter error messages. If you're generating schemas for, for your error checking, you can catch those schema errors and see if it was a type error. Right? If I know that it was a type error of Onyx name, I can reach back into my information model, which is just a big map that I already have, and then go glean more information to build a way better exception message and give maybe the doc string, the constraints that were implicit, and any more context that I could provide. And so having better error messages with this approach in a programmatic sense ends up being a really powerful thing because we overcome one of Clojure's biggest weaknesses, which is really bad error messages. Um, right on top of that, then, you can build much better documentation. One of the, the pieces of documentation that we ship with Onyx um, is the cheat sheet, which is uh, essentially a, a UI manifestation of that big map. Uh, I sat down in one afternoon and I wrote this. It was a very easy transformation of a big map into a website. I'm not a good web developer. That's not like the point. The point was that the, the amount of code needed to do this was really small because it was generic and there was a, a basis for uniformity to be had. Um, and so I think that this is another really big area of opportunity for all of us 
Because if we can all express our systems as information models, we can go build generic tooling to do this kind of stuff. Um, there's, there's nothing really too specific going on here. Forced documentation. One of the interesting things that happens when you have to denote all of your keys in your information model is that you can write tests to make sure that your, your, your keys present uh, in your schemas that were generated are actually documented. Onyx's build fails if you add a new parameter and you don't document it. That's wild. Many projects can't do that. They don't have any mechanism for pulling that off. But this is what forces us to stay 100% up to date from our documentation from what our code actually looks like. Um, a lot of people comment that Onyx's documentation is really good. It's because we have tests for it. <laughs> that's, our, that's really our secret trick. Um, again, you can cross compile. You can take what's in your information model, turn it into JSON, turn it into uh, Avro or whatever, and move it up to a different language. Uh, this is just something that is hugely important, I think, for, for having upstream consumers be more, or upstream producers be more intelligent about the information that they're emitting. Um, and I, my theme here is that explicit information models are a really good point of leverage for generation. I mean, you could just generate so many more things than I, I have time to write down. And I, I haven't thought of, you know, I think you know, a little fraction of them. This is just a little bit that you can do. Um, I think you could run wild with this. I, I, I feel as if we hit on an idea where we're just getting started and I'd like to see the tooling grow at, a, at an accelerated rate. And it makes me really happy to do closure. Um, I wouldn't have come to these, these conclusions if, if the, the thinking in this community hadn't been such to push the boundaries of what it means to be language neutral um, and, and what it means to push extension. Uh, so in conclusion, I, I, I couldn't come up with a conclusion. This is really a rant about extensibility. Um, and it, it's about closure itself. Closure was not designed to be an island and you really shouldn't make your system one. And I, I hope I gave you a lot of reasons uh, not to build your system uh, in a way where you're, you're shielding yourself from other uh, producers and consumers. And I hope you can take all these ideas and use them on your own projects and that have hopefully sparked some amount of creativity. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. It was really eerie having silence for 51 minutes. So I'm gonna look at my screen and hope everyone's still there. Oh, hey, you're all here, great. <laughs> Did you want to uh, enable your webcam so that we can see you while you answer some questions? Yes, awesome. I can find the button. <laughs> where, where is it located? Um, you should be able to, oh, it's so strange looking at this. You should be able to uh, just re-enable your camera. From, yeah, I'd like to stop screen sharing. Um, you shouldn't have to. I'll just switch it back to your face. Oh, no, it's me. I lost you. One moment. Um. Oops. Sorry, everybody, just one moment there. Hey, there we go. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, look at all the questions. Um, I will start from the bottom, I guess. Uh, so question is, is there any best practices to document examples of information model? Um, I think that the last point that I hit on is, is probably the thing to do. You'd, you'd probably want to have an explicit map denoting all your assumptions. Um, and I think it's really important to actually avoid the, the Markdown style documentation that's really pervasive uh, on GitHub. This is a much better approach. And you can generate the Markdown style documentation if you really like that too. Um, it's another thing that you can do. Uh, can you tie everything in this talk back to property-based testing? <laughs> everything? Um, I, I Probably. Um, yeah, I, I can't. I can't think of anything that, that totally misses the mark. Um, I'm sure we could always come up with an argument for that. Uh, while debating the data versus code, it is obvious that using maps to represent operations in actual code invocations introduces a schema of what the system's allowed to do. However, is there the possibility of leveraging native code form uh, 
through some form of analysis. Ah, okay. Uh, and I agree that this is human genetics. Great. Right. Um, I, I've thought about this a lot, and this has been suggested to me over the years. I've never been able to put enough thought in this to, to think about um, think about how you can do this in a way that still gives you that amount of visibility. This seems to, to draw in my mind uh, a, a corresponding situation where I think Colin Fleming was trying to design better closure error messages. And that seems like the same route um, where you're trying to have like code, but that's generated through data. And so you're hopping back and forth. I think you can do it, but I don't think I'm really the person to answer that. Someone else could probably put in a lot better, um, better thinking. Oh, thanks, Bridge. I just realized that these are in uh, voted order. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I will do the one with three votes. How does your concept of a log-driven architecture and its use of it relate to Kafka and Kinesis? Um, so it's, it's the same idea that you have a strictly ordered um, sequence of messages in a log, and they need to be played forward in order. Um, Onyx's use of a log is only for coordination, is not for doing any actual data processing. So the amount of log messages it needs are tiny, and that's why we can get away with using Zookeeper for it. Um, if you need way higher throughput, Kafka would be a great choice, and it would fit in perfectly, because all you need is a strictly ordered sequence of messages. Um, can you clarify out of band and in band with an example? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I hate to do this, but the, the only thing I can come up with right now, I'll, I'll answer this again after, but I, I think when I said that you might be using uh, like a transient or a volatile field for an object as opposed to in band um, would be that you can actually serialize objects in Java using those things. And when you serialize them, transient field will drop out of your serialized object. And so you had to know about that when you read your object back in. So it's this like extra little piece of information that you didn't know about. And closure, closure data structures have no such, um, uh, no such corresponding thing. When you have a map and you serialize it, you get the whole map back. Uh, why do the types of Haskell and QuickCheck framework there not have this multiplicity problem? Does it? I don't know. Um, I figured someone who knows better, uh, better type systems uh, than I do could answer this. And I think it's because they have more expression for combining types um, where you can like take something that is more data structure and then you know combine it with your more property specific types uh, I certainly wasn't trying to say that I don't think that Haskell can do well at this because that's like one of the primary places where quick check does really well um, but I'd be interested to know what someone else who does Haskell uh, a lot could say here because I don't have that perspective are there any good tools that help you build information models or resources to learn it? Um, we have been making it up as we go along, but we've been doing it by driving it based on our needs for when things, you know, just kind of go haywire. And we, we wanted a little bit of an extra, um, extra like oomph for knowing what happened. And we've also been trying to look at other projects and seeing what they have in their documentation. For example, adding the version numbers to the keys was something that we did pretty late. Um, we didn't realize how useful that would be. And we, we saw that in other projects where like the, the configurations were being versioned. And so we just thought, oh, we'll do that too. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, the Kirby of these things where you're just sucking in other things that you like, and then you, you pull it into your own system and great, it's yours. You have one now. Uh, in your log driven, uh, how much time do I have, by the way? Two minutes. Um, in your log driven functions, you use actual function names. Can you tell when you would do that and when you use more declarative messages um, about the trade-offs both these approaches. I don't know if, um, yeah, let's try that one after. I'm a little confused there. Uh, can you please elaborate uh, in the log-driven segment the difference between updating the replica and performing side effects? Sure, so the replica is a, a, a regular immutable data structure that is only recording the actions. Um, performing side effects is, Things like actually hitting a database, talking to a network, doing things that um, are, are not easily recordable through themselves. You need to have like additional um, information to know what happened. So yeah, the replica, I, I call it a journal as if it's a sequence of things. We, we tend to condense it down into one, um, one view of what's going on. And that's why I use a map rather than uh, an array there. Uh, cool, it looks like it's it. Thank you so much, everyone. I, I couldn't see chat while I was talking, but I'll go back and answer any questions that were uh, in the chat room. Looks good. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us.
Um, I also just wanted to say thank you to all of our viewers. Um, this has been absolutely great. We've got a lot of great information and resources being shared. Um, right now we have a lunch break going on. Um, so we will resume in a little, about an hour and a half-ish. Um, so go have some lunch, go stretch your legs, and we'll meet back up um, for another couple of sessions. Thanks so much, Michael. Thanks. See you okay. guys. Bye. Folks.